morning, everybody. Um, I'm Sharon Waller, co-chair of um, Oxy 2007, and I'm delighted to introduce our second keynote speaker, Professor Dylan William, who will be exploring some of the ways in which technology will change how learners are assessed. Professor William is Deputy Director of the Institute of Education at the University of London and Professor of Educational Assessment. In a varied career, he has taught in inner city schools, directed a large-scale testing program, trained teachers, served a number of roles in university administration, including Dean of the School of Education, and pursued several research projects focusing on supporting teachers to develop their use of assessment and supporting learning. From 2003 to 2006, he was Senior Research Director at the Educational Testing Service, Princeton, New Jersey, in the United States. So you won't be surprised to learn that Dylan is a leading expert in the field of assessment and is often consulted by the media and government for his views on assessment and education in general. Dylan has many publications to his name, perhaps the one that is most often cited for its influence on classroom assessment practice is Inside the Black Box, Raising Standards Through Classroom Assessment, which he co-authored with Professor Paul Black. This followed a major review of the research evidence on formative assessment. As you will hear this morning in his consideration of some of the ways in which technology can change how learners are assessed and how teachers can be supported in facilitating that process, Professor William continues to influence policy and practice by pushing the boundaries of our understanding of how best to design assessment in order to improve learning rather than just measure it. Please join me in welcoming Professor William to OXI 2007. The emphasis in my talk today is going to be very much on the learning rather than the technology. And I hope to convince you about why that's a good, good idea. Uh, I'm going to start off with some pre precepts about learning, about teaching. I want to point out that what we really need in classrooms are what Lee Shulman calls pedagogies of engagement and pedagogies of contingency. I then want to turn, in closing the talk, to the role of technology and I'm going to suggest that the role of technology is supporting rather than replacing teachers. And I want to suggest to you that the really important and exciting development for technology in supporting learning is in something called classroom aggregation technologies. First of all, why do we need to raise achievements? Because it actually matters. People with longer, with longer education live longer, they have more money, they are healthier. Society benefits by having lower criminal justice costs, lower healthcare costs, and the economy grows faster the more educated your population. It's just as simple as that. So where's the answer? Well, this morning the Conservatives announced small high schools as their platform priority. Um, I used to live in New Jersey, and our state capital, Trenton, was part of this new small high schools buzz. They took a 3,000 student high school, divided it up into six 500 student high schools in the same building. <laughs> And they wonder why nothing changed. <laughs> Chicago has tried a statewide small high schools initiative. It didn't work. It improved attitudes. Teachers got on with kids better, but they didn't learn anymore. Government liked things they can do easily, so they could change curricula, they replace textbooks, they could go for charter schools or vouchers or, or uh, academies or trusts. And of course, technology. Technology has been about to revolutionize classrooms for about 30 years. And as Heinz Wolf once said, the future is further away than you think. The latest work was interactive whiteboard. Charles Clark, when he was Secretary of State, decided that every school in London should have one. And we were fortunate enough to have the resources to evaluate that properly. And what we found was there was absolutely no evidence of impact on student achievement. Actually, what we found was there was evidence of no impact on student achievement. There were as many schools where putting in whiteboards had made things worse as there were where they made things better. The problem is that we were looking in the wrong place for the answer. We had three generations of school effectiveness research. The first one was raw results. 
Yes, some schools get good results, some schools get bad results. Ooh, that must mean that some schools are better than other schools. Yes, so the conclusion was schools made a difference. Then people said, hang on a minute. The schools with other kids are getting all the good results. They're the ones in the posh areas. So people said, ah, right, okay, so we'll control the social class. And what did they find? Social class actually accounts for most of the variation. So the conclusion from this was, schools don't make a difference. It's all to do with poverty. And then people said, hang on, why don't we actually look at what the school contributes? Let's look at how much the kids knew when they started at that school, and how much they knew when they finished. The value-added approach. And what that has shown is that actually it doesn't matter very much which school you go to, but it matters very much which teachers you get in that school. The variability at teacher level is about four times the variability at school level. If you get one of the best teachers, you will learn in six months what an average teacher would take a year to teach you. If you get one of the worst teachers, that same learning will take you two years. There's a fourfold difference in the speed of learning created by the most and the least effective teachers. And it's not class size, it's not between class grouping, it's not within class grouping, it's the quality of the teacher. So we have, in classic economic terms, uh, a labor force issue. There are two solutions. We're going to sack all the teachers we've got and start again, like Ray Ronald Reagan tried with the air traffic controllers. Uh, nice idea. Unfortunately, there aren't any better teachers out there who are deterred by burdensome certification requirements. And actually, new teachers are actually pretty bad. You don't really learn to teach at all well until you're six or seven years into the profession, and some recent data from, from Australia shows that the amount of value added by teachers actually carries on increasing for about 20 years. Basically, almost all teachers are almost useless when you start. <laughs> and you're halfway decent by the time you finish. There's nothing harder than teaching. And you're hardly ever successful. You show me a teacher who's satisfied with what they're doing, and I will show you a teacher with low expectations. Our constant experience is a failure, but by learning, by attending to them, we can actually get better. So, we actually think that the only way to improve learning at any kind of scale is to improve the effectiveness of the teachers we've already got, what my colleague Marty Thompson called the love the one you're with strategy. How do we do it? And what is the role of technology in that? Well, In the past, I've talked about the difference between quality control and quality assurance, and you know that basically the quality control is the kind of bolt-on thing where you actually inspect things coming up the end of the production line. You actually look at the things, and if they're any good, you let them go, and if they're bad, you send them through the production process again. So you inspect in quality, and everybody thinks this is very bad. Quality assurance is good because you build quality into the process, so there's no need for inspection at the end of the process because you design quality into the manufacturing process, and quality is designed in, and therefore that's good. Except that, for some processes, quality assurance is more efficient than quality control, e.g. automobile manufacturer. That's why Toyota is the most efficient auto manufacturer in the world. They built quality into their production. But nobody has yet managed to do that in silicon chips, as far as I understand. So the, the most efficient way to make silicon chips is actually to make lots of them, and test them, and throw away the ones that are useless. So, the crucial trade-off in whether you go for quality control or quality assurance are to do with testability, complexibility, and predictability. And the question is, where does learning fit? Now, the Brenda Denver for her PhD thesis back in 1986 uh, produced an extraordinarily detailed map of young children's acquisition of number. So each of these little blobs is a skill. So for example, what she showed was that there were almost no kids who could do subtraction without being able to count backwards by one. So counting backwards by one is a prerequisite skill for subtraction. And she mapped this very, very accurately. And what they did was they looked at programs designed to help children learn. Now, look at this map here. Here are the, pre the, the prerequisite skills, these arrows of dependencies. And obviously, kid knows this, kid knows this, they know this, they know this, but they don't know this. So this is obviously a target for teaching. The teacher then designed a pre program of teaching specifically to address this skill for this child, one-to-one. -one. What happened? The child learned those things up there. That's what got learned. We cannot... Now, anybody who's been in a classroom more than a nanosecond actually knows this. We cannot predict what it is that children will learn as a result of our teaching. 
So we cannot have quality assurance in learning. We have to have quality control. We have to keep on checking on what it is the kids have actually learned because we cannot predict it. You cannot have perfect teaching. There was a, there was, there was, there was a, a, a craze in America a few years ago for perfect teaching where they would give these teachers scripts you know, designed by experts about how to teach really well. And they were really scripts. So things like, now, walk around the classroom. <laughs> and the point is they were useless because classrooms are effectively chaotic places. Actually, even well-behaved classrooms are chaotic places in that the difference between one course of action and another course of action is so small that it's effectively uh, only described well by chaos theory. So you cannot prejudge the complexity of the situations the teachers will face. So, what gets learned? Well, here's another slide which shows some items from this third international maths and science study. I, they're both about which fraction is the largest. The first item, 88% get it right. The second item, 46% get it right. And it's not the fact that the numbers are bigger in that second question. It is the fact that a lot of the kids had a naive strategy, the biggest bottom is the smallest fraction, that got the right answer in the first question but not in the second. Yeah, which fraction is the smallest? Look for the biggest bottom, six, choose A, correct. Which fraction is the largest? Look for the smallest bottom, four, choose B, incorrect. So what gets learned is actually very, very difficult to predict. This shows how slow learning is. We actually tested some kids over a five-year period, uh, asking them basically as a mental arithmetic task, if they could actually make some notes, what is 860 plus 570? At age six and a half, fifteen percent of kids can do it. At age eleven and a half, about ninety percent of kids can do it. And I think what most people will be surprised by is how flat that line is. That every year, only about fifteen percent of kids are getting this. Yeah, fifteen percent. So in a class of thirty, six kids are getting it this year. One every two months. The SASM project found that typically in teaching, one-third knew the content at the beginning, one-third didn't know at the, at the end, so only one-third learned the content, and half of these just forgotten the content six weeks later. <laughs> did you know this? Perhaps more surprisingly, some did better on the delayed post-test than on the immediate post-test. Some kids didn't know it at the end of the teaching, but they did know it six weeks later. The important thing is that what gets learned as a result of a particular sequence of instructional activities is impossible to predict, but student errors are not random. Those are the two most important insights from 20th century psychology. And most of our pedagogy is designed around the idea that students are, er er errors are random. When kids don't get stuff, what do teachers do? They do it again, but slower and louder. It's a model based on association. The idea is, and it's actually quite you know, quite respectable psychology, the idea is that learning is a process of forming links between the stimuli and, associate, uh, uh, and responses, and therefore learning is, is assembling these chains of stimuli and response, and if they, ha they haven't learned something, well the problem is that those links aren't strong enough, so you reinforce, so you rehearse. So repetition is actually the right thing to do, if that's what happens when learning takes place. But it's not for most of the kinds of learning that we're interested in. It is actually probably a good model for learning the times tables, but it's not a good model for science learning and math learning. The conclusion from this is that teaching is interesting because learners are so different, but only possible because they're so similar. And that's why learning is a, is a liminal or threshold process at the boundary between control and chaos. You cannot respect the individuality of every single child, but also you don't have to. But the difficulty is learning to cope with and reducing that complexity into something that's manageable. And it's also why all that research on learning styles is completely fruitless. Um, loads of stuff on learning styles and students doing VAK inventories. It's all a waste of time. Partly because it's impossible to actually cater to the individual needs, and secondly, it's not even a good idea. Can I ask you all to fold your arms? Now do it the other way. Learning in your preferred learning style is like folding your arms the way you like doing it. It's comfortable, it's natural, it feels easy. Learning outside your preferred learning style is like folding your arms the other way, and it feels really weird. But what's interesting 
is you actually then start to have to think about what is involved in folding your arms. And doing it the way that you don't find comfortable actually gives you more insight into what is involved in folding your arms than doing it the way you like. So what's really important is kids need a balance of being inside and outside of the third learning styles. And you don't need to know which kids are in which stage at which time. You just need as a teacher to vary your teaching style. Now, I want to spend a little time talking about learning power environments. And learning power is, is a concept that Guy Claxton has, um, uh, has put forward. The key concept here, the big trap, is that teachers do not create learning. Yeah, that's true. Teachers do not create learning, and yet most teachers behave as if they do. Yeah? Learners create learning. Teachers create the conditions under which learning can take place. Our schools don't function like that, which is why somebody once joked that uh, schools are places where kids go to watch teachers work. <laughs> and certainly with the intensification of test results, I see teachers working very If the teachers are going home more tired than the kids at the end of the day, the wrong people are doing the work. <laughs> the crucial feature of well-regulated well-engineered learning environments, and I think it's an important way to think about this, it's about creation of effective learning environments. It is an engineering process. The key features are that it creates student engagement and they're well-regulated. I'm going to say a bit more about each of those. Why engagement? Well, it turns out that intelligence is partly inherited. So what? Actually, you remember the media, you think that, that wasn't true, but every single psychologist who knows the, knows the data knows that actually there is an inherited component and it's not zero. But it's also partly in, in, environmental. It's like physical height. Taller, pe taller parents do have taller kids, but the height that kids eventually reach is based on a whole other range of factors such as nutrition or all that We've always known that environment creates intelligence. What we haven't understood until recently is that intelligence creates environments. It turns out that intelligence becomes a better predictor of people's jobs the older they get. That's completely counterintuitive. You'd expect the importance of intelligence to be less and less important as people get older. And it becomes more important because people choose for themselves cognitive niches that match their preferred level of functioning. And kids do the same in classrooms. In some classrooms, there are kids who are actually trying to answer every single question the teacher is asking. And those kids are actually getting cleverer. Their IQs are going up. Neil Mercer of the Open University has shown that when kids engage in meaningful dialogue in science lessons, their IQs on Raven's progressive matrices, which are purely spatial IQ tests, go up. There are other kids in the same classroom who are trying to avoid being asked a question. Those kids are foregoing the opportunity to get smarter. So if any teacher is allowing kids to choose whether to participate in the classroom discussion or not, you're actually exacerbating the achievement gap. That's why we need pedagogies of engagement where we create learning environments where there's a high cognitive demand, which are inclusive of all students and where participation is obligatory. And um, a good example of that is the work of the Hungarian-American psychologist, Csikszentmihalyi, who invented this concept of flow, and the interesting thing about his work is he completely turned around the research on motivation. Most psychologists up to that point have treated motivation as an input. Some kids have it, some kids don't. Kids who have it do well, kids who don't have it do badly. But he said, actually, motivation is an outcome. When you give kids challenging stuff to do that is just at a level of challenge they can cope with, they will be motivated and they will actually, they will actually get into the sense of flow. Whereas, if the challenge is low, they can become bored. And he, he, he documented lots of cases of mountain climbers, ballet dancers, chess players, who talk about getting, getting and those of you who have been involved in computer programming, you know, it's that idea of, I'll be with you in five minutes, dear, and three hours later, you actually think that you, it is only five minutes later, and it isn't. So pedagogies of engagement are important, but why pedagogies of contingency? Well, as I said earlier, it's because learning is unpredictable. There are, we've, we've done a good job of actually getting assessments that evaluate institutions, describe individuals, but we haven't done a good job of using assessments that actually support learning. And that's why formative assessment is so important. It's because we can't predict the learning, therefore we have to monitor the quality of the learning constantly while it's taking place. Now that's just my opinion. But the research says it's actually the most effective improvement you can make to teaching. So beginning with the Gary Nefiel in 1987, within the last 20 years, these studies are syntheses of, between them, around 4,000 research studies. 
and they find consistent substantial effects. I want to focus on Je uh, Jeffrey Nyquist's work, which is not very well known because it focused on higher education, but he looked at different kinds of feedback, knowledge of results, knowledge of results plus knowledge of correct results, telling kids what they got wrong and what the correct answers were, giving them an explanation of some kind, giving them specific actions to take for reducing the gap between where they are and where they need to be, and most sophisticatedly, what he calls strong formative assessments, where you actually give them an activity to do to close the gap. And what's interesting is he found about 180 studies, 31 on weaker feedback, effect size 0.14 standard deviations, feedback 48 studies, average effect size 0.36. And the important thing about this table is that more effectively, the principles of effective formative assessments are instantiated the bigger the effects. I think what's interesting from the point of view of learning technology is that most of the learning technologies have actually got stuck in the feedback only mood. And that's why the effect is disappointing. So you're getting something like twice the effect when you actually think, find ways to do give activities that close the gap. Just how effective is this? Well, um, one of the things that I think we, we don't do very well in education is actually to do cost-benefit analyses. We say, this is, has a significant impact on student learning. So, how big an effect, and how much did it cost? Class size reduction. Reducing class size by 30% actually gives you a 20% increase in the speed of learning. But it costs £20,000 per classroom, per year. We could get, we could get, well, if you increase teacher content knowledge by one standard deviation, you get a 5% increase in the rate of learning. That's actually very small. Well, it's smaller than most people would think. And nobody knows how much it costs because nobody's managed to do that yet. If you get teachers doing formative assessments in their classrooms, you get a 75% increase in the speed of learning, and it costs about £2,000 per classroom. So that's why I'm advocating formative assessments. And I don't... And, and, and so for me, the driver is formative assessment. Now can technology help? rather than technology is the answer, now what's the question? And so the search for me has been around what kinds of roles can technology play in helping teachers do effective formative assessments in the future, because that's the place where we're going to get the really big impacts on student achievement. Um, and those are about three generations of pedagogy. The first generation of pedagogy is additional pedagogy, which is the kind of chalk and talk. You have negligible contingency. I just say stuff to you. And I, I hope you get some of it, or I can actually polish my presentation and maybe get it better. But uh, there's no feedback at all. The second generation is all student response systems. So as I go, I collect information on everybody, and the contingency, the, con the degree of contingency, depends entirely on the teacher skill. What I'm going to argue is that the role of technology in improving learning is primarily in what I call third generation pedagogies where we have automated aggregation technologies which actually take the responses of different students and do some smart things with those things and give the teacher advice about what are the sensible next steps. The, the really brilliant teachers are doing this already, but most teachers can't do it. And so the challenge of the third generation pedagogy is to have the, the contingencies of the teaching. So what do you do when you know that the teaching didn't work quite the way you intended? And that's supported by technology. There is a paradigm evolving in America called evidence-centered design. Basically, you design assessments starting from what it is you want them to do. That doesn't sound very radical, but for assessment, it is. And, uh, and um, Almond, Steinberg, and Levy have a, invented what they call a, a four-process architecture for assessments. And so you actually have the selection of tasks, the presentation of tasks to, to the uh, assessee, you identify evidence arising from their performance, and you find ways of accumulating them. And we'll say a bit about each of those in turn. So this is about questioning. This question, look at the following sequence. Which is the best rule to describe this sequence? Well, the correct answer is all of them. Because depending on what N is, any of these can be right. I don't learn anything from your thinking, by just knowing which one you choose, I have to have some sort of, well, why did you choose that? So I have to get some reasoning. Compare it to this item here. In which of these right angle triangles is A squared plus B squared equal to C squared? No, it's not. Yeah. 
No. B and D. Now, if I'd given you letters to cards with A, B, C, D, E, F on them, and you had to hold up the correct answer, that would be an all-student response system. There'd be no way for you to hide because I say, you haven't given me a choice yet. And, and with, with smaller audiences, I really do that. Um, and we'll have to it again for you later on. Um, but the point is this. B and D are the correct answers. So if you hold up B and D, then you're correct. And if you get anything else, you're wrong. But you're, you might be wrong in an interesting way, so you might just hold up B, or you might say all of them. But what I'm saying is that by having crafted this question in a smart way, just from knowing what you chose, I get very, very good information. And if I'm teaching, I can do a quick check, and if everybody gives me B and D, and I, I move on. Yeah? If, everybody gets, if everybody gets it wrong, I do it again slower and louder, like most teachers do. But if half of you get it right and half of you get it wrong, I can then say, well, you thought it was B. You thought it was D. Why? And you can have a good discussion. But the point is that the design of the question allows you to make those very strong inferences, and your chances of getting this right by guessing are incredibly small. Because there are six possibilities, and the solution space is 2 to the power of 6. So your chance of getting the right combination by guesswork is 1 in 64, not 1 in 20, as it is in a typical multiple choice item. So the right tasks. Now, what's interesting is you can't use this item with the clickers that are proliferating over higher education. Because the clickers, or most of the systems, only allow one correct answer. And so, therefore, you've got this problem of kids getting it right by guessing. Whereas well-designed questions with multiple correct answers give you a very, very small solution set compared to this, the whole space. And give you a really strong warrant. Ice, uh, an example from science. Ice cubes are added to a glass of water. What happens to the level of water as the ice cubes melt? All the answers are correct. A can be true for evaporation. B can be true if you are a good physics teacher. C is a good answer if the ice cubes weren't floating, but were piled up like a scotch on the rocks. And D is actually the correct answer because I didn't tell you what temperature the water was. And it turns out, of course, that the, the physics teacher's answer is actually not correct. Because what happens when ice melts is it cools down the water. So the water shrinks. And less is between 0 and 4 Celsius. In the case of this round. <laughs> so, but this is a great, this is a great question to have a good, good discussion about. But you, there's no point asking this question unless you've got the time to hear people's answers and get an argument. In comparison to this one, the ball sitting on the table is not moving. It's not moving because no fault this is a pushing or pulling on the ball. That's the common misconception, yeah? Gravity is pulling down, but the table is in the way. How things are wrong with that, can you? Gravity pulling down? Yeah. Table in the way? Yeah. Table pushes up with the same force that gravity pulls down. That's obviously what the science teacher is looking for. Gravity is holding on to the table. Hmm. That looks pretty good, too. There's a force inside the ball keeping it from rolling off the table. That's not correct, obviously. Um, but it's an interesting misconception. It comes from children thinking about inertia as a force rather than a property of matter. But the interesting thing about this question is this is a great question for checking on students' understanding of physics because B and D are correct, but not physics. And if all the class give the answer C, then you know they've got the point you were trying to get over about the opposition of forces in, in, in equilibrium. Yeah, B and D are actually correct, but they're not physics. So again, this is a very, very high-powered question, and uh, Mark Wilson and Karen Draney at uh, Berkeley University, University of California, Berkeley, have got some lots of items like these, which are incredibly powerful, and kids almost never get them right for the wrong reason. So that if you actually get the right answer from kids, you know you can move on quickly. But they're incredibly hard to come up with these items. Um, I quite like this question. question. What can we do to preserve the ozone layer? And you read through, reduce the amount of carbon dioxide, yeah, reduce the greenhouse, yeah. yeah. So can you for us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go. Properly dispose of air conditions and fridges. Does not look like an item. But the item writer ran out of ideas for the last option and actually thought, I'll put something really stupid in there to see if they're awake. Unfortunately, it's the correct answer. It's the only correct answer because the others are all about the greenhouse effect, not the depletion of the ozone layer, which was caused by the proliferation of chlorofluorocarbons, which were caused by improper disposal of air conditions and fridges. 
So these, these good questions can take a little while to come up. In English, you know, you've got the traditional English literature question, look bad and round or bad. Great question, but you need to discuss it. Where is the verb in this sentence? A very good all student response question. This one is even more sophisticated. Which of these is the best thesis statement? Now, this is only rele relevant to a particular genre of writing known as persuasive writing in the USA. Um, C is actually the best thesis statement. They're all credible thesis statements, but there are some ones that are not as good as C. And so the important thing is the teacher knows that if kids choose C and reject D, which is also a thesis, as is E, but it's not a thesis within the genre of persuasive writing. And the fact that the plausible distractors are so good is what makes it a powerful item. But these items are very hard to come up with. We call these hinge questions. They're questions that are based on an important concept that is critical for students to understand. And when we use them with teachers mediated through teacher intelligence, we say to them they must be able to collect and interpret the responses from all students in 30 seconds. So you can't get kids to explain that. The teacher always to me, oh, I get every child to explain their answer. But they never do. Because by the time you've heard from the 23rd child, the rest of the class is losing the will to live. And so they never do. And so what we're saying is that we need to, first of all, if we're going to have technology helping learning, the first thing, and what technology cannot help us with, and what the clickers can't help us with, is questions that are worth asking. And that's a skill and a craft that we're actually only beginning to get to grips with. Um, you can use these kind of questions for very, very low order things. So for example, instead of doing a, a test on figurative language, you just give them cards with A, B, C, down to, uh, to H on them, and you just read out the things on the right, and just say, he was a bull in a china shop. Which is that? And you hope the kids say it's a metaphor because the word like is actually missing. You may have a drop of water, it's actually none of these, it's like totes. But the point is you can actually run through these very quickly, and of course some of these have two correct answers, like the sweetly smiling sunshine is personification and alliteration. So these good questions can actually help teachers make instructional decisions in real time, and it's these kinds of decisions, these kinds of adjustments to student learning at a whole class level, it, what is it, the research has shown makes the biggest difference in creating both pedagogies of engagement and pedagogies of contingency. Because when you actually require a response from every single kid, there is nowhere to hide in the classroom. So everybody has to be engaged, and the teacher is constantly adjusting their teaching. Maybe 5% of teachers can do this currently. Now, what I'm suggesting is that we need to move towards more sophisticated methods of, of evidence identification, I mean, currently, the great teachers do this with dry erase boards. Everybody hold up an answer. You know, give me a fraction between one six and one seven. And we can write it down, one over six and a half. Interesting answer. Shows me that they're thinking. But we need to explore the use of technology in order to capture that information so that we can actually begin to do something smart with it. So we've got the classroom clickers, we've got the traditional keyboards, wired and wireless, and a note pen. I don't know if you come across the note pen. Was, so there's a classroom with a set of this is the low-tech version, because you have a set of A, B, C, D, E cards on a string attached to the chair. And the teacher just says, okay, reach for your card, give me an answer. So it's not, it's always there. Um, your little pen is very smart because it knows where it is. So you can actually say, for example, if you care about such things, give kids a map of Britain and say, just, just put a cross where Manchester is. And the kids are doing it at their desk on a piece of paper, put a cross there, and the teacher can actually see where all the crosses are. That is the beginning of classroom aggregation technology. Because it's when the teachers can begin to aggregate the information from different students. So that's the, that's the evidence identification. Palmer wireless keyboard has been used in lots of classrooms in America, and the classroom clickers, as I said, the next generation will presumably have a facility for multiple correct responses. Discourse. And there's a software package called Discourse. This is a very interesting example, because you have a screen the kid has a screen like this, where there's a, there's a question, and the kid has to type a response on the screen, and then the teacher has this screen here, where they can actually see the kid's responses as they're writing. So you can actually sort of listen in on child number 13 and say, I uh, haven't written anything in a little while. But the other thing is, then you can actually project one child's response to the whole class, either anonymously or with attribution, and use that as a focal point for discussion. And with multiple choice questions, you can also have the uh, scored automatically by, by matching with a key. So this is a good example currently of an aggregation technology, but it doesn't allow evidence synthesis 
except for multiple choice questions. <clears throat> now, some of the really exciting stuff is happening uh, at the place I used to work, which is ETS, where we have evidence identification software for non-multiple choice answers. There's a package called eRater, which does automated essay scoring, and it now scores essays more accurately than humans. Scary thought, but actually it's not so scary once you realize how bad humans are at marking this stuff. But basically, um, and, and in many high-stakes exams, now there's one human marker and one automated marker, and if there's a difference, it goes to a third human, or a second human, third marking. Um, but what's interesting is it does this because actually what most people pay attention to are very broad surface-level features like grammar, usage, and mechanics, spelling, style, and organization, like, you know, is the last paragraph saying in conclusion or finally or to sum up? And it's incredible that it just a package that looks at those kinds of things actually captures almost all of what teachers look at. It doesn't look at meaning at all. At the other end, there's a product, there's a product called C-Rater, which is actually a paraphrase analyzer. And what it does is it takes a short answer question to a question like, what are the important principles in photosynthesis? And it looks at what kids have written and it tries paraphrases of those and see whether it matches the, the list of right answers they've got. And these are being used in high-stake examinations in, for example, Indiana. But they're quite limited because you have to choose your questions carefully. And in the um, Indiana National Assessments, they also use a package called M-Rater, which is actually a marking graphs and equations or, in, or, in an automated way. The problem is that all these technologies are really good for summative assessments, but not good for formative assessment, because they only help you get a unidimensional answer. So what we have here is we have a chart showing what I think is the current situation, which is the important thing, the multiple choice technology is when you have highly structured evidence. You know, it's, no, you know, it's either an A, a B, a C, or a D, or an E, and we actually manage to do a lot of work with highly structured evidence. So this dimension is whether the evidence is structured, and this is the degree of teacher mediation necessary for the aggregation. Now, the ABCD cards are highly structured, and therefore you can actually have teacher mediated. This is, the teacher looks at all the ABCD cards. But because the evidence is highly structured, clickers do the aggregation pretty well already. The big goal is to get something happening up this top right-hand corner, because what we need is automated analysis and synthesis of unstructured information. And the reason that's so important for formative purposes is because currently we're only very good on accumulating evidence for unidimensional student models. What we're saying is, let's use all the evidence to, to put the students in rank order. He's good, he's not so good, they're in between. And what we do currently is build these unidimensional student models. They're useful for summative purposes, but they're almost useless for formative. Because all you know is this kid needs to be better. We're telling a bad comedian they need to be funnier. It's not helpful. It's true, but it's not helpful. If we're going to get serious about formative assessment using technology, we have to de develop multi-dimensional student models. And the, this is where the evidence-centered design becomes very useful because we can use Bayesian inference networks. So what we would do is build a proficiency model, which is actually what proficient performance looks like. We build a task model, which is what, how does the task that we're setting relate to the notion of proficiency? What is the evidence model? How do we go from the, the outputs that the student produces towards evidence? And then what we do is we use Bayesian inference to update a student model. So the current cutting edge in this area is trying to build student representations of knowledge. Trying to build what it looks like to be expert in this area. Trying then to develop tasks that elicit that evidence and how in real time you might capture evidence of student achievement to update those models. Because then you can start using the, the, the hardware and the software rather than the teacher's um, bandwidth can be used to parse the information. So you could actually at some point either say the whole class needs to do this or divide the pieces of the following subgroups. So I can see it's, uh, you know, at some point a software which actually just prints out at the end of a lesson a seating plan for next lesson. Where the kids say, you know, these four kids need to work together, these five kids need to work together. And it's all based on not on a multiple choice test, but on a constructed response that the children made that was connected automatically, interpreted, and, and, and then obviously some individualization after that. But that's the hope 
that, that, that brings vision. The, the possibility of technology, I think, holds out in really supporting learning. It is teacher-mediated, teacher-supported classroom aggregation technology. So, to summarize, I've argued that raising achievement is important. To do so, we have to change what happens in classrooms, and we have to work with rather than replace teachers. Specifically, the research evidence shows that you get more improvement in student learning when you change teacher pedagogy than when you change subject matter knowledge. I've argued for the importance of pedagogies of engagement and pedagogies of contingency. And I think the role of technology comes in helping us move from single student response systems towards all student response systems where the tech, where the information, where we're collecting information from all students in real time is being, is being up, is updating a student model constantly, but it's not working automatically because I don't think the technology is there. A footnote. I don't know if you come across a product called the Cognitive Algebra Tutor, developed by Carnegie Mellon. It's the only piece of educational technology that's been shown to make a real difference in a wide range of settings to student achievement. You get effects as a 0.4 to 0.7 standard deviations. So 20 years to develop, and it's good for two out of the four or five hours or per week that kids get on algebra in grade nine in America. So 20 years just to, just, just to get good results for two hours a week for one year in, in school. And so while that kind of stuff may long term have a future, I think that if we're serious about using technology to support learning, in, 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 in the short to medium term, it is going to be the focus on classroom aggregation technology. Thank you. Um, we started a bit late longer, so I'm hoping we're going to have 10 minutes for questions. Uh, so we've got some roving mics, so if people have any questions they'd like to put to, to Dylan, um, please raise your hand so we, we can see you. We've got somebody down here at the front. Uh, while we're waiting for the microphone to come down here, we'll take one of the questions from our remote participants. If that's okay, Dylan. Um, we have a panel from the university, uh, Napier University in Edinburgh. He asks, are there differences between motivation to learn and motivation to perform? In other words, should we be assessing performance or learning or both? There's quite an extensive literature on this. Um, people like Carol Dweck have looked at uh, performance orientation versus mastery orientation. And there's no doubt that performance orientation is actually long-term harmful. So, the, so what we need to do is to focus students on learning rather than getting good grades, which is why grades have been so deleterious to student learning. So there is a big difference, and we need to focus on getting students to understand that the really important thing is learning, not getting a particular score or a grade. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you. Thanks for the uh, awesome presentation from your side, Professor William. And my name is Kanish Bedi, and I'm from Universitas Twenty One Global. Uh, we are a purely online institution and we run courses uh, which are uh, accessible to students worldwide. And in our assessment systems, uh, uh, we uh, uh, try to incorporate uh, authenticity as well as possible because our programs are management programs in which there are more than one correct answers and these are equally correct answers. We are at a loss to understand exactly how to use technology because uh, we cannot use objective type questions at this same time, we understand that in order to retain the authentic approach in our case studies and the kind of assessments we do, uh, we um, uh, are not able to apply that kind of uh, role uh, a technology can play. So, what is your suggestion? Uh, in what terms technology can be used in this kind of scenarios? Thank you. First of all, um, the evidence on the problem. Probably multiple choice is that it's very difficult, but not impossible, to assess, high, assess higher order thinking as multiple choice question. The problem with authentic assessment, particularly the case study approach, is that with a typical student, you tend to only assess a small number of cases. So, although the reliability, if you mark it again with somebody else doing the marking, may be very high, it turns out that the reliability of the student is actually quite poor, because what you're really measuring is did they get lucky this time? Was that a case study that they had, they had revised for, as opposed to one they'd actually forgotten three months ago? So, the reason that multiple choice tests come into their own is when you need to make sure that you're actually checking lots of knowledge in different places. And I would say that any system that is purely predicated on one kind of assessment 
is what was bound to be less valid in terms of the inferences that we would support than an assessment that has some bits where knowledge actually is important. Um, so, for example, if I was doing this in America and I was doing um, uh, accountancy uh, assessment, I would want to know that the people I was certificating knew what Sarbanes Oxley said as, a, a, as an act. Um, so, then, and I would do that with multiple choice questions, but I wouldn't rely only on multiple choice questions. So, it's, it's the diversity of methods of assessment that allow you to get into different kinds of, of um, inferences, and that's what makes the assessment more, more valid. Thank you. Any, any more questions from the audience? Uh, we have one down here. Yeah, and one, one up at the top, I think. Um, one? While we're waiting, we have a question from Steve at um, the TLT group. He asked you if you could explain a bit more clearly what classroom aggregation technologies are. It's a good bit of feedback, but I didn't do a very good job of explaining it further. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of classroom aggregation technology I mean, and the brain currently, the human brain inside the head of the best, best teachers, is the best piece of classroom aggregation technology we have. What it does is it synthesizes all the information you're getting from different students and actually makes it into a whole course of action for that teacher. So it's about getting information from all the students and collecting it, aggregating it, and synthesizing it in some smart way to support action. So that, 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 those are what I mean by classroom aggregation technologies. And so, um, Global warming, fact or fiction? Oh, you know, thumbs up if you think it's fact, thumbs down if you think it's fiction. I, that would be a classroom aggregation technology, because I could actually summarize the whole group, get you to think about this and say, okay, well, where, where do we think about that? Where, where, where do we stand? So it's any, any way that allows you to collect information systematically. How do most teachers decide whether they can move on? They ask a question that you haven't planned in advance. They think on one kid who already had their hand up. That kid gives the right answer, and I say, good, well done. And on we go. And so classroom aggregation technologies are an, uh, the antidote to that. It's actually made more systematic about collecting more information from more of the students before you make instructional decisions. Thank you. We've got a slide. Uh, Tom Franks and Franklin Consulting. I've been worrying lately that maybe learning is despite, not because of the teaching. Um, I suppose the, the easiest way to, to, to summarize that is to say that the best prediction of a grade in a subject from a student is the grade they've got in another subject. Um, if, if good teachers were making a big difference, you'd expect to see them getting A's in that, or uh, despite getting D's in something else. But we don't tend to see that. So are teachers really making a big contribution, or are students actually learning despite the teaching? Well, that's why the third generation of school effectiveness studies focus on value added. Because intelligence, IQ, that thing that does exactly what you said, which is the kids are above average on English, but by and large, are above average on, on chemistry and physics and maths as well. And so, yes, there is that factor. We can't change that. But in terms of the difference between what those kids knew when they were 11 and what they knew at 16 or 18 or 21, it turns out that and now you're putting a lens onto a very small aspect of what makes the difference. But it turns out the teachers do make a huge difference. So, then, so yes, the best, the best teacher will give you a C rather than a D. The worst teacher will get you an E rather than a D. So it's a small difference for that kid, but it's a, as I said, it's a fourfold difference in the speed of learning. Because basically one year's learning is about one grade in GCSE, for example. Okay, thank you. I think we have a question up there at the top. Um, don't welcome. Um, Dylan, uh, some of our remote participants are having difficulty hearing you. They think it's a bit louder and so slower. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Derek Moss, uh, how do we how do we, um, we have the personalization of what you said, you know, the emphasis, but we're, we're finding in things like the HEPI strategy, but the, what was the DFES strategy, and um, there's this aspect, if you like, of almost of government policy and personalization of learning. Where do you lie on this? Depends what you mean by the personalization, and I know that there's no consensus about personalization within the former DFES and its, and its successors. So if by personalization you mean individualization, then it's a daft idea because it's not possible and it's not even smart. But if by personalization you mean creating learning environments in which different students can come in in different ways and that the teaching is adaptive, then I'm, I'm, I'm totally in favor of it. And I, I would argue that formative assessment is all about personalization. It's about being more responsive to students, but it's avoiding the trap of individualization. Which is, which is impossible to do because we don't actually allow one-to-one -one teaching because we don't actually pay for it enough for it. And secondly, I'm actually not convinced it's a good idea. 
we have lots of evidence that children and, and, and students often learn better from each other than they do from teachers. So, for me, personalization is about opening up teaching. It's about making more responsive and it's making more the students more engaged, but it's not about individualization. Thank you. I think we've got time for two more questions. Um, do you want to line in one? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, we have a hand up. Yes, lady, lady on the room, midway down. Um, and while we're waiting, that question from George Roberts. How might these ideas transfer to non-classroom based adult community and workplace based learning with a high degree of learner self-direction? I think it would be very difficult because what I'm talking about is the kind of aggregation becomes much less useful when you've got different people coming to different things. Mm. But what you, so therefore I would say that sharing case studies, which you can already do very well, is probably optimal in those kinds of cases. So I would say that they are lucky because they're working in a domain where the problems that I'm trying to solve aren't really problems. Um, but it's also very inefficient because everybody's unique path is more, it may or may not be interesting to other people. Mm. So there's a degree of interest, inefficiency in, in that. Um, so I would say it's, it's, it's not relevant to the kind of things I've been saying here today. Okay. Uh, Tatiana Vitrova Shell. Uh, thanks again for a very interesting presentation and bringing back focus from technology to learning. And I'll continue with my question in this matter. You've, um, concluded that aggregating technology is an answer for formative assessment in the classroom. Uh, but I'll ask you about readiness of, uh, pedagogical theory in terms of interpretation of these answers. Especially for these complex and structured uh, tasks that require lots of uh, prerequisites and lots of pre skills in order to be successful. The, the issue you raise is definitely a problem. So that, uh, and again, it's, 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 the, it's re reproducing what experts already do, and the experts already can make sense of this stuff. One of the things we try to do in one project, which is currently undergoing a randomized controlled trial in the United States, is to give teachers really high-powered questions which focus on misconceptions that students might have and tell them what the misconceptions that students are likely to have and tell them what they mean. So it's a way of bringing in more just-in-time teacher subject knowledge. But I think we need to do a lot more work of actually mapping the, the kinds of responses that students might make and the kinds of um, responses you might make to those responses. What is really interesting is that in Japan, they have a word for this, which is because I thank you. They have a word for the teacher's knowledge of the kinds of difficulties that students have with this material and what, and, and what to do about it. And I think it's very interesting that they actually have a word for it, whereas we just say it's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Bill. Um, that's been a very inspirational um, session, and I'm sure it's given us much good support, particularly um, around the area of personalization. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and thanks too to Maggie for, for moderating so well. So, can I ask you all to thank Dylan for...